So I will start this presentation. Can everybody hear me? Can just type yes in the chat. Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. So <clears throat> yeah, once again, good evening. So this is a yeah. Welcome to this webinar on introduction to robotics. This uh, webinar is organized by Scholar IT Solutions. Before we start, I want to talk about the company Scholar IT Solutions. <clears throat> Scholar IT Solutions is an IT solutions provider. It's a group of professionals with a high, a high amount of technical and domain expertise. And the robust team has been expanded now to serve the entire of US. It's one of the best companies in the US. And they've done a lot of solutions. And they work at, over, uh, all over US. And, and yeah, if you want to know more about Scholar IT Solutions, you can just follow their uh, social media pages, Facebook, website, and everything. And a little about myself. I'm a freelance consultant, and I work as a consulting specialist for a lot of companies. And in my free time, I like to mentor and advise uh, people of the next generation, the upcoming entrepreneurs, and uh, people who are career-minded. And I'm an expert in a lot of modern technologies, and that is the key area of uh, consultation I do in technology. OK, so coming back to the main topic, robotics. So the concept of robotics itself has been there for more than a hundred years, where people started imagining about uh, artificial humans, humanoid robots, and everything. But the technology itself has like advanced only like very uh, slowly in those ages. The concept of artificial intelligence itself came only in the 1970s, but it's almost 50 years before art artificial intelligence is like widely available to everybody. So that is the problem with robotics as well. When it came up. It was like more than 100 years or even more it came up. But the technology itself was not feasible enough to make something. So people had to uh, like wait this long to get access to technology like this. Because about, uh, like, it has to be cheaper. Like for example, GPS was there since 1960s World War times. And, but we have GPS only in the 2010s. Because only when it's uh, coming to the reach of people, you know it's truly some kind of uh, a big deal. So robotics itself is like, uh, even now it's an upcoming field. The full potential of robotics is not actually done. So if you see uh, the, all the technology debates and business forums and everything, everybody is like talking about already uh, losing jobs to robots. Because uh, we are at the wake of the fourth industrial revolution. And pretty much all the manual labor and everything is going to be automated by artificial intelligence. And robots are play a part of that. Because artificial intelligence is pretty much like uh, a software program which actually does behind things. So, so you know the manual kind of work which humans do, like physical labor and uh, like lifting, like for example, lifting a heavy load or something, or you know fixing something or anything like that. That cannot be done by a software. So the software part of the industrial revolution 4.0 is artificial intelligence, and the hardware part is robotics. And both of them, like you know, work together in various ways. The first thing is like artificial intelligence can actually make intelligent robots who are as good or even better than humans. So that is the overview of whole uh, the robotic situation. We are like only like in person, like five to ten percent of the entire robotic scope is actually realized, and uh, the major amount of robot used right now is only in industrial applications, and it is set to revolutionize the world in the next hundred years. Okay, so what are the concepts behind that? So whenever we see a robot or something, we see it like with an eye of a child. We see that with an awe, like, oh my God, it's very good. How can it do that? How can it do that? But there's a lot of complex technology which goes behind the actual robotics, like how robots work, how they actually do things, and how they like you know understand things. Because we, uh, as people, understand things in a different way. For example, let's just say, um, this webinar or any kind of thing, we look it with our eyes and we process it with our brains. And robots are kind of similar. They have cameras and they have chips which process everything. But it's that is saying it as very simple. There's a lot of complex technology which goes behind decision made by a robot. Just how we have a neural system, like and uh, all the other systems in the human body. The robot's body also has like a lot of systems. <clears throat> so the components of a robot. The first and main thing is power source. Like we eat food to actually do anything. The robot needs some kind of power source. And then actuation. Actuation is some kind of action. 
like how we have human locomotion we have hands legs we can run we can walk so in order to for a robot to actually do all those things we it requires actuation and sensing sensing is uh, like how we actually look uh, look and feel touch smell and you know hear thing so the robot has to get some in input and then react with an output so it's very similar to a human in in the way it works everything but the technology itself is different how from our organic tissues work and manipulation and locomotion so all these things are collectively uh, responsible for all these kind of tasks so example is uh, manipulation i can say like uh, the robot can actually use all these things and it can be programmed to actually do some tasks and it can use a set of complex kind of behaviors to actually achieve locomotion well uh, the common set of things which can be used to achieve locomotion in machines is like wheels or something but let's just say you want to climb a mountain so in that case you would need something else you can't use a typical wheel there are special uh, kind of wheels and you know tank treads were designed because they could you know go on any terrain so that a technology itself has like you know come in some kind of different wheels which can actually traverse any terrain okay so there are different types of actuation and we'll see about the different types of actuation and sensors in detail in the upcoming slides right now i'll just give you a lab, uh, like a basic introduction so actuation can be of three types electrical drives pneumatic drives and hydraulic drives and power source can also be pneumatic solar and nuclear and nuclear is like an understatement because the technology itself is not uh, and uh, shrinivaslu can you please mute yourself uh hello can you please mute yourself okay okay thank you okay so the general kind of things which power uh <clears throat> robot right now is batteries and solar batteries in the sense it like we charge the batteries and we put them on put them on the robots and there are some kind of robots actually using gasoline engines as well but they have not been proved efficient because a gasoline engine or anything like that uh, has to be started before it can be used while the battery can you know immediately give an output so batteries and solar are the kind of uh, technologies widespread in using uh, robots and there is no point to actually having a wired robot uh, in industrial purposes most of these batteries are actually wired because they don't have to move around they are in a single place and uh, only the other robots which move around actually have some other battery operated uh, mechanisms but in general industrial robots are wired to something because uh, yeah they don't require like uh, to be moved around okay so this is an electric drive so the concept of an electric drive is very simple so we have an electromagnet and we have a, a magnet so the alternative electric forces which actually occur because of the electro uh, because of the north pole and uh, south pole repelling when it happens in a rotation uh, like you know uh, cylindrical shape it it starts revolving i mean rotating and uh, rotating so when it starts rotating it produces a rotational force so here we are co converting an electrical force using an electromagnet and a magnet into a rotational force so that is the basic of an electric drive from the small toy motors which you find in all these kind of uh, toys which come from china to all the advanced kind of ro uh, electric cars and you know wheel driven robots everything uses an electric drive and electric drive has become an important field of study and advancement mainly because of the overwhelming amount of uh, research and funding which is going into electric cars itself and also it is the go to method of driving things because you can immediately get an output from a battery and the the energy efficiency is actually very good and it's also very eco friendly if you actually produce the electricity with uh, renewable means and everything like that so the amount of research and uh, technology investments going into this is huge and it's a very very good way to like actually come up with uh, a proper way to drive something Ma mainly because when you increase the electricity you are increasing the capacity and when you are actually modifying the electric drives uh, magnets and electromagnets you just have to increase the capacity and you can scale this to any amount actually you can make a giant motor to a small toy motor so it's very scalable from a small electric car it, and now we have electric aeroplanes as well doing short runs in dubai and germany
and pneumatic drives. So pneumatic drives are <clears throat> are different in the way they drive things. For example, you, in other kind of drives, you need a rotational kind of force, like an I mean electric drive. So you need a rotational force. But sometimes you might not require a rotational force. For example, you might have seen these ex excavation sites in buildings and construction. They have this kind of uh, JCBs and everything, which is ex excavating all these things. So those kind of things, if you notice, there will be some kind of, uh, if you see the slide, there will be some kind of thing like that. So these, these are pneumatic drives. So these are filled with gas, and they work on the principle that when you, the gas is like pressurized, it exerts a force. So that force is used to drive, drive the mechanism. So this force can be really useful when you're using just a robotic arm or a fixed robotic mechanism where it's a robotic arm or a robotic kind of uh, forklift or anything like that. Because you can use, take advantage of the fact that gases exert pressure when they are pressurized at low temperatures and everything like that. So pneumatic drives are mostly used where you have to actually have fixed applications and pressurized gas is actually much easier uh, to act, uh, applicable here and even if it fails you just have to repressurize the gas and you just have to adjust the mechanism and the flow of the gas and the pressure and everything can be con uh, controlled using valves so for example let's just say you want more force a more crushing force or anything like that so you just have to increase the pressure and that makes it very efficient in uh, in fixed applications where this kind of robotic uh, control is required. The artificial intelligence or anything else also can be actually programmed to uh, automatically control all these behavior and mechanisms. And the third type of drive is hydraulic drive. So hydraulic drive and uh, pneumatic drives are kind of similar because pneumatic drives use ga pressurized gas and everything, but hydraulic drives use fluids. So they use both fluids is like anything which flows. So they use gas as well as water or any other liquids so i mentioned fluid instead of water but the com most common used is pure water but at, uh, in some other applications other kind of uh, uh, viscous material or some kind of other fluids are al also being used in hydraulic drives so in in electric drives we use this repelling force of the magnet and the electromagnet to actually produce that rotational force but in the hydraulic drive we use the pressure of the fluid like when you have this kind of pressurized container the water pressure and when you, uh, you have a piston mechanism where you release the pressure and the water starts swirling so that swirling motion caused by the water makes the drive to rotate so in this kind of drives the rotational force is caused by the fluid pressure so it's called a hydraulic drive and hydraulic drive is actually used in heavy kind of machinery and in, in industrial applications if you notice except for the electric drive the other two drives are mainly used in industrial applications mainly because these drives were only specialized for their industrial applications and they have not been used anywhere else because this kind of force to the way uh, <clears throat> force to the efficiency ratio is not required elsewhere and so electric drives are the least used drives in terms of today's application of robotics yeah so coming back to sensors so the main two components there, there are a lot of components which make up the robot itself but the main two components are sensors and actuators so we actually saw about the actuators so what about sensors? So sensors are very, very important. Mainly because our eyes and hearing and everything like that, we react to all these kind of external stimuli and then take an action. For To actually have that kind of sense in a robot, we need a lot of amount of sensors. So there is like so many different sensors. The one I'm showing in this picture is very, very less. There are light sensors. There are like, you know, IR sensors, which we find in our remotes and ultrasound sensors. They can actually detect this kind of small sounds, which can be like, you know, um, you, if you know about echolocation, you send a sound wave and it, when, when it comes back, you detect it and you use that to measure the distance. So that is like ultrasound, uh, ultrasonic sound sensors. And you can actually detect the lights color because using a color sensitive sensor, soil uh, moisture sensor. These are the common use sensors for everything. Temperature sensor, which is found in our air conditioners. So these sensors provide essential information. And this information is very much required for a robot to actually take actions. For example, let's just say there's a, uh, you have a robot which is monitoring your house and it, it requires some kind of sensors. For example, there's a fire in the garden. So it, re it requires to have a gas sensor 
or a smoke sensor. So only when that kind of smoke sensor starts giving different kind of values, for example, let's just say normal smoke sensor value is one. So if the value changes to 2.5 or 3.5, it means a large amount of smoke is coming. So depending on how much smoke the smoke sensor is inhaling itself, the robot actually decides the threat. So if somebody is just uh, burning a small fire or something like that, it doesn't raise an alarm. But when it, it like it goes beyond a level and the smoke is too much, and it raises an alarm, and then uh, the next action is taken. So if I, I what am I supposed to do? The smoke is a lot. Should I signal the owner, or should I? If the robot is actually having some kind of mechanism, let's just say it was designed to be a firefighter robot. So it has a pressurized pump inside that, and that's an actuator. So using a pneumatic drive or uh, elect, uh, yeah, most probably a pneumatic drive, it can actually like you know spray on water or some kind of uh, uh, carbon uh, extinguishers which you see in those malls and everything. So it can use something like that to put out the fire because the time taken for the owner to actually get the response and you know come here, you can actually build a firefighter robot. So that is one of the scope of doing that. Any kind of buildings and sensitive buildings like industrial applications, industrial applications, a lot of chemicals and everything is used. So humans going inside that place is like a bad thing. So we can send robots inside. And robots do a good job at a lot of things and they can be repaired and reused while human lives cannot be. So that is one of the key areas where robots can replace humans efficiently and effectively. The amount of sensors that are manufactured today in bulk is numerous. Every single application, uh, like from your mobile phones to everything has a lot of sensors, GPS, GPS sensors, uh, like uh, field sensors, NFCs, everything. So all these uh, sensors play a really important part in um, actually giving some information to for the actuators to actually take actions on. Okay, so coming back to the software part, robotic operating systems. So robotic operating systems uh, is in short for ROS, it's a middleware. So what is a middleware? So when we are using the computer, it has a hardware and to access that hardware, we are using a software, which is like Windows 10, Linux, Mac, everything like that. So you, without that, we can't actually communicate with the computer. And for example, on top of that, let's just say you're using some more software. You have Windows 10, which is an operating system. So if you want to have uh, like you know a word or excel or anything like that you install an application so middleware is something which acts like some uh, kind of uh, in kind of question like it connects two people or two things or two software or two uh, software with humans so ROS is the is a set of libraries software libraries which does exactly that so what does what it does is uh, whatever I've said about like sensors and actuators is kind of like an introduction because uh, saying about say, all these kind of different kind of drives, there might be so many types of electric drives, brushless motors, brush motors, everything. There's like so much things, but that goes beyond the scope of this uh, webinar because it's about introduction to robotics, not something which is in detail. So to add, control all these advanced kind of ap applications and uh, sensors and actuators, you the robot itself is a very complex thing. Like we have two eyes, uh, two nostrils, two ears, and we have two hands, two legs, and we have a lot of different bones, everything. And to control all these things, we have a brain. So ROS is like that. So it has to be the uh, place where it can help you interact with the physical world. And for that, you need an interface. So first you need to install an operating system on the robot. And then you need a middleware, which communicates between the operating system and you. So ROS enables you to write applications for the robots you design. And it's an open source thing and uh, uh, open source library. You can actually download it for free from the internet. So if you're really into like, you know, hobbyist robotics, you can just buy a kit from Amazon and download ROS and you can start making simple robots even now with simply following instructables or YouTube videos, everything like that to actually get started on this whole robotic scene because there is a huge amount of scope. So what else does ROS do? Like if you see this picture, I took this specific picture because this is one of the strengths of ROS. So this is a simulation. So when you are designing robots and when you're prototyping, you cannot really like, you know, keep on testing it in every single environment. Like for example, let's just say you want to test it uh, on land, but if you uh, have this kind of robot, it will get damaged in land. 
and you can't keep on testing it over and over again so simulation is a way of you know getting this some kind of values some kind of uh, output from a robot you design without actually using that robot in real life so you can actually design a robot with certain sen sensors actuators and everything inside uh, inside this ROS and then you can actually preview how it will react in the real world so this is an example of that how will a car with sensors with different sensors and everything so if it operates in real life how will it do how will it operate what kind of output will come so there is a small kind of obstacle so how it will respond to that obstacle so those are the kind of stuff this does so what happens with this uh, software is it helps you gain this kind of input without actually going into the playground it's almost like you get a lot of data from your own design without actually building it or even uh, putting it in real life so it saves a lot of develop uh, like development time in terms of robotics before uh, people used to sit and an entire year to design a robot there were like in back in the 2000s and 2005s like you know people required so much of uh, things they have to design everything from scratch and they have to like you know do every single thing by themselves and that is time consuming it for an average robot it took like about eight months to 12 months to build back then but right now with the technology and software we have and the kind of advantages that ROS gives us we can actually start building the robot within a span of two months from like eight months and 12 months like that now we can build a robot in two months or even less if you have a team and robot ro building robots is not uh, like if you see that in the movies or anything like that they show as if like building robots is very uh, simple or it can be done by a single person but that's not the case because robotic itself is like has multiple technologies intertwined between each other and like for from hardware somebody might be a hardware specialist they are like really good at that and somebody might be a software specialist and somebody might be an ai specialist so it requires a team at least five to seven people who are specialized to actually build a decent robot which can be up which can be useful in real life and ros simplifies this whole concept so what it does is like you know makes this concept really fast and allows you to test this and you know uh, and you can also integrate it with other kind of services for example open cv is like computer vision and for a, and your uh, um, you know this kind of wikipedia ibm watson all these information sources in the internet you can actually connect the your robot to the internet using internet of things all you have to do is like you know in, uh, install your internet of things on your uh, robot and you can actually connect it to the internet to get information for example if you want to navigate your robot in terrain and you don't know where the road is or where everything is so you install a gps sensor and get the gps output from the internet or these gps signals and use that to actually navigate the robot there is like so much scope whatever i'm saying is like very very less compared to the actual scope of this uh, robotic itself and where are we going with this so the amount of uh, effort put in here is incredible if you want to have a career in robotics it's a very rewarding field right from age five I've seen till age 60 or plus, everybody is fascinated by robots. Because it's it's like that, it never loses its appeal. From movies to everywhere, robots are always fascinating. It's very amazing to see these kind of uh, artificial humans working and one day, like, you know, replacing all of us. And that day is not far away. I'm In my own personal estimation, I think that kind of uh, times is like very near, maybe 2040 or 50, I think everybody, everything will be robots. <clears throat> one second okay so i'll talk about each and every uh, field of robotics where and how it's being used in the current situation and then i'll talk about the future applications as well so i'll start with agriculture the most important uh, part of human survival is agriculture so we need food and if you notice the medical science has been improved a lot in the last 20 years and a lot of uh, people's survival rate and everything has increased in developing countries as well a lot of uh, medical facilities are accessible to many people and because of that population has been increasing almost every country has some kind of uh, population increase in the last and the birth rate is uh, kind of steeping up and the death rate is coming down and this kind of trend is an upward trend so it's not slowing down so we have mouths to feed and the amount of farmers is reducing as well. 
so what happens the we have farm lands which are like you know we left empty and there's nobody to farm because it's not viable for a farmer to do all this work and usually the farmers use traditional methods so in the traditional methods it's are effective in doing what they do but they are not actually the best kind of methods when it comes to yield per square meter so yield is like calculated like how much can you make from a square meter of land or square feet of land like that so traditional people do not have that kind of access to that matrix and if you take another farm to train another farmer for it will take about at least five six years before that farmer becomes a good farmer because some crops depending on like you know six months eight to eight months they take forever to grow and let's just say some crops grow for 1.5 years or something you need at least three years or four years or 4.5 years to train that farmer to be actually good enough so this is where robots come in you don't need that much time to actually train robots because you have this kind of elder farmer who's been experienced as a farmer for 60 years you can collect information from them and you know find out how he is so effective at farming and then you can put this inside an artificial robot farmer or you don't have to actually create a robot but a, a machine which can actually do the job instead of him with sen sensors and actuators yeah and there is a lot of things from you know pulling out weeds to actually ma making sure that the soil temperature is right and the plant health is actually like you know right and all these other fields which are there like iot and uh, artificial intelligence are intertwined here as well you data from the internet and also data sent to the internet to the iot is actually very valuable even when you have a very efficient farm uh, setup running you still have room for improvement so the data which is collected constantly is passed on back and it's analyzed and the robot itself with the help of artificial intelligence is growing each time and each circle cycle of uh, farm it does it's growing as a farmer not just uh, like you know a robot which is doing the same thing over and over again it finds out its mistakes it finds out its uh, errors and it starts making the whole process efficient automatically a well designed system like that automatically learns from its mistakes like the way we do and manually doing a lot of things like pulling out the weed watering all these plants in a right amount not uh, making sure that, that they're not over watered or something like that is a tedious task while when you're using robotic systems it's much more efficient and also less time consuming and for that is that you have to maintain the machines which can be done once a week or once a month and that is more efficient and the, the these days in the countries like scandinavian countries like norway and everywhere the robotics are so efficient that they've designed multiple robots for different kind of things like they've designed one robot to monitor and there's like one robot to chase away all the pests and one robot to actually pull out the weed and all of them are working together and for example let's just say there's a bigger animal coming in like a rodent or a raccoon there the two or three robots work together to chase away that so when i saw those videos of that in youtube i was really impressed about how these robots can actually communicate with each other like how humans are so this these concepts are known as like you know swarm intelligence of how how multiple kind of robots or anything can work together to do some tasks which are like you know impossible for a single robot to do home services and these kind of robots are widely available right now so you've seen these kind of robotic vacuum cleaners they are quite efficient at cleaning and they are very silent and they are amusing to kids and pets alike and even when you're not at home you can actually program them at this time or that time to clean your house and some some of these advanced and expensive robots actually can clean themselves and recharge themselves they go and dock near the charging port themselves and they actually clean and they put everything in the dustbin by themselves and these robots i mean are kind of uh, also uh, coming with uv rays and everything like that so they are much more efficient at cleaning all these kind of uh, houses and they also keep it germ free without a single amount of human intervention and even if you put them on top of the table they have obstacle avoidance mechanisms so they don't fall down when they reach an uh, end or something like that they turn automatically and this kind of uh, this kind of uh, robotic vacuums are not actually popular enough i mean cheap enough to actually be in every household but soon they will be in the next 10 years nobody's going the, uh, the jobs of maid or house cleaners are not going to go away because these robots are going to be incredibly efficient and they're going to become cheap and 
everybody is going to be able to afford these kind of things and healthcare <clears throat> if you are a fan of fictional movies there's a lot of external exoskeletons they call it as exoskeletons so these kind of robots are used to augment humans and these uh, mostly used in industrial applications where you have to lift heavy loads or anything uh, you can actually use an exoskeleton or an actual robot but sometimes you need an exoskeleton because uh, you uh, giving that control to a robot might not be the right thing to do in that for example it's a delicate application or anything like that so in that case robot can actually work as an exoskeleton to actually just perform the tough work while the human can control it these kind of things used to be only in fictional movies before that but now it's come to reality and the next application is like you know healthcare where robots are given as caretakers i'm not sure if people actually saw this kind of a recent movie android kunjapan from uh, like yeah this uh, kerala people they took this movie and then it was really nice because uh, an elderly man is actually taking companionship of an android robot so that is an uh, that is, uh, even though that's a really, it's a fictional it's a really good example of how pe- robots can actually be good companions as well and when people are lonely or require mental health or anything like that robot can robots can be amusing and like i said robots amuse people from age group of 5 to 50 there is like no kind of uh, people i've seen they are not fascinated by robots so that is like uh, it's age age agnostic and everybody li- loves to have a robot companion obviously and also maintaining like you know uh, the for example monitor their uh, health or temperature or blood pressure levels and all elder people tend to ignore all those things so a, a robot can help them with that and also like uh, certain kind of people require like you know physical assistance like wheelchair handicapped people or something the robot itself can be inside the wheelchair making the, making sure that they can uh, uh, effectively move around and they are not they are safe at all times without their intervention at all right now only luxury people like you know very rich people actually have access to this kind of technology but soon it will be there for everybody transportation and logistics and if you have heard any anything about amazon warehouses amazon warehouses actually have more robots than humans and why is that because when you order something on amazon if you've noticed it comes very fast if you placed it at the right time and that is because humans are very minimal in terms of you know sorting out things and picking something out of the warehouse they have made this system so effective that the robot accurately come whenever you order something they actually have this order processing system which can transfer what the requirement to the robot and the robot goes and fetches the product and it goes to the shipping center immediately and right now it the robots actually the task of the robots actually end when the when it actually gives it to the shipping center where it shipped with using a vehicle but tomorrow the shipping center the shipping vehicle the person in charge of the warehouse everything will be a different kind of robot because autonomous vehicles are here and in foreign countries are already already uh, like <clears throat> already experimenting with you know pizza delivering robots which actually deliver packages and everything using a robot and amazon is experimenting with airships where they use drones to actually make deliveries instead of humans and transportation and logistics also has a much more uh, applications like that for example in dubai you have this air taxi service and autonomous uh, transportation service in the new mazda city where all these transportation is entirely automated you just have to go inside and it's safe to like you know uh, go inside the pods and it automatically goes and delivers uh, all these things autonomously yeah and structure examination so structure examination and all these things are kind of like uh, structures as in buildings or any kind of complex mechanisms machinery or anything usually they are ex- inspected by humans for example you have to inspect a cell phone tower and it's like you know very high and it's kind of risky for a human to climb that up uh, and it it's actually a safety measure they have to be very careful and there's like a lot of people you know falling down and breaking themselves and everything like that and there are certain tasks like you know cleaning the windows which are on top of the things and you know going to places where humans for a human it could be very dangerous so for like one of the examples i've seen this is like where the, there was a solar farm 
where the solar panels were at very uh, tall uh, buildings and they had to be cleaned because solar panels are only efficient if they don't have any dust or any other particles coated on them and for that a company used a drone robot to constantly monitor and clean the solar farm so it's as it stays peak efficient and the drone itself is automatically recharged by the solar energy over there so that is one of the interesting applications of how we can use robots to automate a lot of manual tasks which can be harmful for a human and space space exploration at this kind of situation both uh, the, any other planet other than earth is not suitable for human life and we can't really go there there's a lot of people you know speculating about going to mars but it takes time before that planet is actually ready to actually house people like us so at this time you might have heard about this mars rover and if you notice the, ro uh, the wheels of the rover they're specifically designed they don't look like act, uh, real wheels and uh, the <clears throat> the mechanism holding the wheels together is also very different so why are the wheels designed like that like i said about earlier about robots traversing a, a difficult kind of terrain so they have this kind of uh, wheel systems designed so they can actually go on top of any terrain without any problems the shock absorbers and the mechanism itself is very flexible so the robot or anything like that doesn't get uh, damaged with the uneven and unevenly distributed hardness and friction of the Martian universe. And the, the robot is filled with sensors and it's powered by a solar panel and it constantly keeps on exploring the Martian surface and it's sending all this valuable information through interspace communication to the NASA space station. And from the space station, it's sent back to the NASA substation, which is there on Earth and all this information about mars is collected to to you know learn about all these things so this is another uh, example of like how robot can replace humans and with by without actually like you know putting a human in uh, like uh, that kind of dangerous situation and search and rescue missions as well before we used to use dogs and dogs are very really good i mean really good at you know sensing people to rescue and everything like that but they are limited they're only they can only smell people for example when there is this kind of place where smell itself is out of question like a flood or anything like that dogs cannot be efficient and they, they are good swimmers but they'll, they'll still not be efficient like in the 2015 floods and here and everywhere like there was people had no way to like you know rescue people who are drowned in the water and everything so in these kind of situations robots and aquatic robots also exist and these these kind of things can use a wide variety of sensors like you know infrared sensors ultrasonic sensors everything to locate people in a much efficient way compared to animals or other modes of means of you no know, rescue search and rescue operations and again they also have this added advantage of you know being the less risky part of not risking a person's life to actually do the job one of the more interesting uh, uses of robots is like replacing soldiers every day our soldiers die in the borders defending the, our country and everything and these are valuable lives which are lost people who are like dying every day to defend the borders of the country and these uh, in my personal opinion this is the most uh, i mean the best application for a robot because people who are like you know very important to us are dying for us and defense should be the foremost place where we are implementing robots so how can they be used in like defense if you know uh, this country called israel they already use a lot of robots and drones to bomb their nearby country in israel the war is still going on and they already use uh, robots and uh, drones to actually put in all these bombs and gather information so they are sending drones and robots into places where it could be dangerous for a human which is enemy territory so we could do the same thing for border patrol and coastal uh, uh, coast guard everything all the services can be replaced with robots environmental monitoring so environmental monitoring uh, is uh, the main applications of environmental monitoring is like weather so weather is really important for many kind of business activities and also like you know protecting people from harmful natural disasters like tsunamis floods and rain rain could be uh, like you know very harmful if it's in excess so these kind of environmental mo monitoring is constantly required and sometimes these weather stations are not that efficient mainly because they're fixed in one place if we have a patrolling robot which is like you know uh, patrolling various places to collect all this information it could be much efficient actually predicting the weather compared to all these fixed applications 
forestry and afforestation has been like a goal for nearly 60 for 70 years and nobody has actually found an efficient way to do that mainly because when you, uh, you go and plant uh, trees or anything inside the actual forest you are at danger of actually being encountered by wild animals at the same time you're disturbing the ecosystem or you're causing some kind of problems when you actually go inside there so these days i've seen a lot of videos where they use drones and drone controlled uh, <clears throat> droplets using that as to like you know start the uh, forestation process again the main uh, advantage of using robots everywhere is that they replace humans and they make the work efficient and they uh, increase the safety levels of humans safely sitting and operating them in a or you know just monitoring them from a far off distance without actually disturbing the ecosystem you can actually go in plant something or you can actually have a robot look like an animal it can go inside and plant something in the forest and just move around without any problem at all so these are one some of the actual places where all these kind of robots are being used in the future they proposed like robot drivers and robots replacing every single job that's you know boring for humans or it's tedious for humans like you know cleaning cleaning uh, and I've seen videos of uh, robot chefs actually making really good food by imitating real chefs. The scope itself is left to imagination of how much of space of these robots can actually replace us and fill the fill in for the humans. And the future itself looks very bright. And people who are early adopters of any technology always have an advantage. So if you are learning robotics right now, it would be really important. I mean, very useful to you in the future. Even if you are in some other career or anything like that, and you. Uh, not uh, learned it you should actually have some kind of knowledge about this if, even if you don't know how to make a robot you should at least know how to use a robot that kind of skills always pay you off well in the long run when these kind of robots take over the technology like both in hardware and software there are so many bots taking over everywhere and it's not far away the time is not far away before the robots actually uh, leave their uh, leave the industrial uh, area of their application and they invade your house and they invade everywhere and they just replace everybody. Okay, so before we go to the question and sessions, I will just tell you about all the kind of careers which you have in robotics. So in robotics, the basic kind of jobs right now is robotics engineer. So robotics engineer is very self-explanatory. You actually work as a robotic engineer to bring that robotic design to life. So you as a practical problem solver have to design and engineer that uh, product in such a way that the application fits its needs. So like a, if you see a home robot, it's actually have to be very safe for everybody from small kids to everything. But industrial robots do not have that much of a safety concern because it's going to be used by professional people and the safety itself is a waste of time designing the safety of that purpose. So you as a robotics engineer should understand the actual solution at hand and effectively engineer a product which is useful for that exact situation. And other fields like you know using electronics or creating custom electronics and circuit boards, this field is actually a uh, port many of a lot of other fields like mechanical engineering, electric engineering, mechatronics, and uh, also you know the circuit board, uh, designing a circuit boards and producing sensors. Sometimes you have to produce your own sensor because the kind of sensor you won't want actually uh, you have to produce it yourself or if you want to design an effective sensor for your robot because it's important application so in that case you have to be in a, a you have to engineer and reverse engineer and maybe custom engineer all these kind of parts and products so the main kind of roles is like you know robotics engineer artificial intelligence engineer and uh, software engineer these are the kind of jobs which you can are uh, currently open and hiring and there's a lot of other customization among these jobs as well which you can apply for and learn and even if you're not, uh, you know, like going to actually pick up this field or anything, you should never at least know how robots work and how to control them or how to program them in a basic level. There's a lot of programming languages coming up like Scratch, Python, which is very easy to like, you know, learn and pick it up. And you can actually write scripts for that for robots. And that makes it uh, like accessible to everybody. Yeah, so, <clears throat> So that is about all the, the entire session. So right now, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and you can ask. And if you're, yeah, if you're not comfortable talking in the uh, microphone, you can actually type it in the chat and I'll answer your question.
Okay, so while we are waiting for questions, if anybody have any questions and if you want any kind of guidance, uh, you can contact me on my LinkedIn. I'll sharing, I'm sharing the link on the chat. You can just send me a request and you can ask me about anything. I'll be happy to guide you in your career or uh, life and everything. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, so I'll just show you some interesting application of robots before we end this session. We have like about five, 10 minutes of time. Okay, so one bot. Okay, so this is one of the interesting systems I've, uh, I've came across. And what it does is that it automatically waters the plants and it actually like, uh, yeah, it automatically waters the plants and it manages this entire lot of plants. So once you've done the system, it automatically waters the plants, it plucks out the weed, it makes the plant grow, and it also harvests that. Okay, good evening, Harini. Thanks for, okay, thank you. Uh, we are about to choose course for college. Yeah, it has scope everywhere. It's not like uh, there is no scope over here because uh, if you know about the recent pandemic, a lot of people in China have been like, you know, uh, taking their manufacturing facilities to India. And a lot of uh, uh, special economic zones and IT parks and industrial parks have been set up around everywhere in the country. And these industrial parks are rapidly growing as, you know, special economic zones where everything is there. and uh, it's opening up a job for a lot of people that people the China the Chinese people made a mistake of causing the world pandemic and because of that the at least 30 percent of the companies have moved away from that and also the upcoming facilities of Japan and Korea are all actually coming to India than going uh, to other places robotics as definitely has a scope right uh, even right now and Robotics engineer is actually having a lot of scope here. You just need to be like more uh, you need to do a little bit more of research it depends on where you're coming from as well. If you if you have a, a company which is hiring in robotics, and uh, before you take up this course or any course that for that matter, always think about the job market. So LinkedIn and any kind of insights. Uh, don't read blogs. Go directly to LinkedIn and look at the jobs, job openings, and everything. And if you see that robotics or uh, people are just hiring, you could just easily go to LinkedIn and click on uh, jobs. This is a really fun way to like you know find out. So I can just type in here like robotics engineer. You see that robotics engineer intern ROS, everything is coming up. Everything which I what I've said. And look at that. Bangalore, Bangalore, Chennai, lead robotics engineer, Delhi. Yeah, this is how you find out if there's jobs and people hiring for these kind of uh, fields or not. And almost every, you know, these robots can also, uh, although they are entirely automated. Maintenance engineers are required to actually make sure that the robots are, uh, you know, efficiently running. And these kind of simple search in LinkedIn can like, give you a lot of information about whether you have to choose the course or not. And it depends on the place you are, you are as well. Sometimes, for example, aeronautical people have more scope in Bangalore, and uh, IT has more scope in Hyderabad. So depending on where, which place you come from, also matters. You might have to move to another city or if you're if you know that your city the people are hiring in this kind of domain it could be really useful to you and have you already chosen the course or are you going to choose the course like, like a side uh, kind of uh, thing or uh, can you be a little bit more detailed about that so i can give you accurately what to do so you finished 12th standard and you're trying, thinking about choosing robotics Yeah, then I would say if you really are fascinated by this, uh, robotics and other fields uh, are kind of a little bit more work than usual. It's not that much work, but still you need to little bit, put a little bit of effort. So it all depends on the, your own kind of mentality. If you are really excited by this field and working and being a part of this field, then you should choose it. So if you are uh, like going for, 
yeah, a stable career or um, how do you say, you want a typical kind of job, like an IT job or something, then you have to go for an IT job. But I would advise against going uh, for an IT job at this point because uh, there is so many people going there and there are certain fields left out, which is like, you know, uh, leaves a wide gap for a lot of people. I'm and IT is still a good field. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's just that a lot of other fields are very much ignored and there's nobody going there. And that makes it like, you know, easier to get a job than other fields, if, especially if you're actually interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed Anzar. So does anybody have any other questions? And Harini, you can just uh, send me a request in LinkedIn. If you want to ask more questions, I'll be happy to help you. Uh, yeah, you can do it. Electronic engineer can do a robotic MS. Yeah. Uh, it also uh, you have to like you know uh, check up with the university you're trying to do as well some universities have uh, most probably they will because electronics mechan uh, mechatronics and everything are actually related to robotics very very uh, deeply so you can most probably do a ms in robotics and that is also another safe option if you can you, you can do your ug in some kind of uh, computer science or a typical engineering field and you can do a PG in robotics if you're like you know really scared about uh, the job market and everything. Okay, okay. It was really nice giving you a session and everything like that. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, okay. So I think that that's all. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar and uh, please remember to follow uh, Scholar IT Solutions on LinkedIn and all the other social media. And yeah, thank you for coming to my webinar. Thank you.